My name is Nick Weston. I am completely ordinary in every way. Well, I guess you could call me a little short and skinny. My unspoken motto all my life has been, don't make waves. My life was quiet, average, and perfect for me. I didn't earn very much, but I lived somehow. I had a good job, even if it didn't generate rave jokes at parties. I dated several women, had serious relationships with even fewer, and married one. Kelly became my wife, and only with her did I feel special. Don't get me wrong, I didn't have a live and let live philosophy, far from it. But even I admit it's nice to win the championship, earn a prize. This is exactly how I responded to marrying Kelly, and after our years together, she still makes me feel like a relationship gold medalist. Well, minus a few weeks. Just because I firmly believe in not looking for trouble doesn't mean I'm easygoing. At least that's what I thought. Others apparently thought I was easygoing. Why did everyone think differently than me? Yes, I'm not exactly impressive, but still. To tell the truth, in my entire life I have never had to come to the point of a fight. I just did the best I could to live without causing problems, and no one ever saw the need to attack me. But I told myself that I would not cave in and endure if I was ever attacked. A special snake overgrown into my garden was another employee of my company, Jack Knowles. While I was working in climate control, he was working in the receiving and shipping department. He was everything I wasn't. Tall, well-built, ruggedly handsome, and completely self-absorbed. From what little I've learned over the years of us working at the same place, he used to play sports in college or something like that. Those days are gone, but he has worked to maintain his physique as well as his demeanor. According to Jack, his nickname on his previous team was the mountain. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you are the only one who doesn't believe someone else's bullshit? It's like wearing glasses from the movie Strangers Among Us. Only these ones recognize idiots. Everyone in our group, men and women, seem to hang on Jack's every word. People laugh at his stupid jokes. Guys gather around to egg him on as he brags about his sexual exploits without being too secretive. He flirts shamelessly with all the attractive women in the office, whether they are married or not. In addition, he could take long lunches at his whim and finish work early without fear of reprisals from management. Well, you get the idea. In general, all this time I was asking myself how any of these usually intelligent people could fall under his spell. God, some of the guys even called him Mountain sometimes. Of course, such things were annoying but I don't want to give the impression that I'm obsessing over it. This is just an observation. I kept myself together, did my job, and went home to Kelly. Jack and I had never crossed paths at work, so I kept my mouth shut. I didn't want to make waves after all, so I don't understand why Jack decided to pay attention to me. Maybe he realized that he wasn't making the right impression on me. Maybe I fit the classic relationship between a bully and his victim, but he targeted me. It all started small, little things, like when guys just egg each other on, insults about my height and size. There were rare occasions when I needed to go down to the loading dock to get documentation, and he would ask if I needed him to get it for me off the top of a table or something like that. Those around him laughed, and I giggled, playing along with him and letting him know that I wasn't paying attention to it. For some reason, Jack Knowles has decided that Nick Weston is his new source of entertainment at work. It didn't take long before I became Baby Nicky. Yes, this nickname was applied to me from time to time in my youth. Doesn't matter. But now this is how I was addressed at work, where adult professionals gathered, sometimes in the presence of superiors. I could practically feel the contempt for me growing in my office, and it was as if I subconsciously knew that, judging by what everyone thought of me, I had already seen my last promotion in the company. It doesn't bother me. The guy is just having fun. It's okay. Don't create problems. You're imagining everything. Looking back, I realized that my usual tactics actually worked against me. But this was a trait learned throughout life that cannot be overcome immediately. Besides, I figured that if I ran into him, he'd laugh and slap me on the shoulder, saying he was just joking. If I had been outraged enough to file a complaint... I doubt anything would have happened to the golden boy. 
Most likely, I would eventually lose my position when my colleagues turned on me for creating some kind of difficulty. Knowles means no harm. He just lifts everyone's spirits. Don't forget, whether I was wrong or not, I still didn't believe that I was a weakling. I was convinced that the threshold beyond which I should begin to act was not yet stepped over. Perhaps, in retrospect, I myself was partly responsible for the events that were about to occur, creating the conditions in which the seeds could take root. All this had been going on for several months when Jack decided to escalate the situation. They brought me a package of important papers from another office. Jack noticed my name on the package as he passed the mail cart and decided to deliver it himself. Don't yawn, Nikki. Special delivery. That was the only warning before the stuffed manila envelope crashed onto my desk. He spun and fell to the floor, knocking over a folding double photo frame. There were two photos in it. My wedding photo with Kelly and her posing on the beach in a bikini from our last vacation. Since I was at my desk and Jack had thrown the bag halfway towards him, he was much quicker to pick up the fallen picture frame. Hey, Nikki, sorry, Jack said with a malicious grin on his face, his tone insincere and condescending. As he stood up straight with the photographs in his hand, I made the most aggressive gesture towards him that I had ever made up to that moment, trying to snatch them from him. Jack dodged it easily and turned them around to look. He looked my wife up and down with an approving grin. Not bad, little Nicky. I can't imagine how you managed to hold it. Since it was just the two of us this time, I sensed much less flippancy and more genuine contempt in his tone. Likewise, I didn't force a smile. After staring at the other man's wife for too long, he casually tossed the double frame onto the bag and turned toward the door. Send this filly to me so I can ride her a little. Someone as wild as she is will sooner or later throw you off. Damn, I'd do you a favor. He spat dispassionately over his shoulder. It seemed to me that for the first time, in all time, something inside me began to tense up. After this, however, nothing much happened. In fact, things between Jack and I were as quiet as they had been before all this started. Too quiet, I should have thought, but I was content to ease the tension and trust that my personal philosophy had weathered the storm and I could set sail again. The company's annual summer picnic took place shortly thereafter. I had just pulled into the parking lot and was looking at Kelly checking her hair and makeup in the visor mirror one last time. It was one of those little moments when you fall in love with a person all over again. I was sitting and thanking the Almighty, looking at the vision of my wife, when she noticed me looking at her dreamily. What are you thinking about, huh? Should I even know? She asked. I just thought it was time for us to go on another vacation. Oh, really? And that's all? Uh-huh, I replied, perhaps in the back of my mind thinking about that day in my office. Somewhere warm and sunny with a beach. Maybe we can buy you a new bikini, or maybe we'll even go somewhere where you won't need it. Ha ha. Would you like to? She playfully patted my hand. Let's. With these words, she got out of the car, and I followed her. My good mood was short-lived. Jack the Mountain Knowles was fashionably late, but that didn't stop him from drawing a crowd around him. There was always a group of men around him, laughing at any nonsense, he said. I was good at keeping Kelly and I at a comfortable distance as we ate barbecue and chatted. However, I noticed that my wife glanced at the group of people from time to time, and she was clearly curious about what was going on there. My luck was about to run out. Jack, of course, positioned himself next to the drinks, and at some point we had to replenish our supplies. I did my best to grab our drinks, literally going back and forth, noting Kelly's definite reluctance to leave the drinks area, and almost breathed freely when he noticed me. Hey, little Nicky, he shouted, stopping us on the way. Does your mother know that you secretly drink beer? Immediately, there was a burst of laughter from our colleagues who were around us, as well as from guests who did not know any of us until today. I mean, come on, it wasn't even a good joke. Come on, he said approaching us so that our size difference became obvious. I'll have to look at some identification before I let you take this. There was another burst of laughter, but I barely noticed it. The reason was that this time there was another one added to the laughter, my wife's laughter. 
the crystalline, angelic sound that I practically live for now sounded as harsh as a beginner musician trying to play the clarinet. I involuntarily glanced at her. I wasn't the only one who caught this sound, and although I'm sure he'd been looking at the modest cleavage of her summer dress more than I had up until that moment, Jack masterfully pretended to notice Kelly for the first time. Well, hello. Do I know you? You are that beautiful woman with great taste in swimsuits. He flashed her a crooked grin. Sorry, she answered. Her tone betrayed her surprise at his audacity, but there was a suspicious lack of anger in it. In fact, there was a hint of a smile playing on her lips. There was a pang in my heart. Yes, Nikki loves to show off to the guys. Show everyone a photo of your amazing figure. I must say that the photograph does not flatter you. What? Really? There was anger in her voice now, but it wasn't directed at Jack. Her irritation at his little harmless lie was nothing compared to the storm that was now raging within me. I admit, I was more than annoyed that she seemed to immediately believe the lies of a man she had never met, especially since this was 180 degrees at odds with what I was doing. Indeed, all the people here knew that unless they were personally sitting at my table, they had not seen this photograph. But not a single soul told him that he was talking nonsense. And if I started denying it, it would look false, whiny, and self-serving. I was trapped, but the main focus of my rage was still Jack Knowles. My face instantly became flushed with rage and humiliation, so much so that it looked as if I had been burned after six hours in the sun. This donkey could not count all his fingers and toes without a calculator, but at the same time he easily manipulated everyone around him, including my wife and, by extension, myself. I still had those glasses on. Why doesn't anyone but me see him for who he is? Now his eyes were fixed on her. He was staring at Kelly, and not discreetly. His body language said I wasn't there, but his words were meant for both of us. I would like to invite you somewhere someday. That is, if you can ever free yourself from babysitting duties. There was laughter again, although more awkward and scattered. After all, my colleagues had at least some decency. My wife, for her part, covered her mouth in shock, but her cheeks betrayed a grin and her eyes sparkled. I have seen that. Damn women. They never miss an opportunity to convince you of their superior perception and that they know men by heart, but this apparent wealth of understanding seems to fail them when they need it most. The mountain had to be dressed like a used car salesman. He was so fake. At that moment, I believed that I had no chance. I definitely didn't have support, especially where I needed it most. Suddenly losing the desire to drink, eat, or party, I gave up the beer and headed out. As I began to move, I took Kelly's hand in mine. For the briefest of moments, she resisted the force pulling her before some part of her brain kicked in, and she followed me. Perhaps she just hadn't expected the sudden departure. But I took her resistance as another mini-betrayal and tossed her hand away like a hot potato before her legs even began to move. I moved with determined but deliberate steps, vaguely aware of Kelly making the typical excuses to the crowd before following me. Jack did not fail to call out, Hey, come on, Nikki. I was just joking. Don't be a bitch. God knows I would never want to cross your path. This brought more laughter, including Kelly's, which I heard start before she stopped. She just couldn't help herself. For a moment, it occurred to me that, for once in his life, Jack might wonder if he had gone too far. But no. This required self-criticism, which he did not possess. Even if by some miracle he did, his pride would demand that he remain true to himself in order to save face. I walked some distance away and sat down on a picnic bench, staring into space. Kelly stood right behind me, watching the drama unfold on my face. I could feel several emotions bubbling within her, taking turns dominating her thoughts. Indignation towards me. Embarrassment. Not for me, but because of me. Confusion. What exactly should she tell me? Perhaps even disappointment? Disapproval? Contempt? How did he set me up so quickly and thoroughly in front of my own wife? And how did she not pay attention to this? Finally, she spoke. Was this demonstration really necessary? I looked at her incredulously. I mean, your friend put you in an awkward position. 
And yes, he was rude. But he was just kidding. It was obvious. He probably does this often. I slowly stood up and looked into her face. My friend? Never mind. I don't know. She decided to change tactics. Hey, if you don't want guys hitting on your wife, maybe you shouldn't show off your product to your co-workers. I could only bow my head slightly with my eyes closed and shake it a few times in frustration. Kelly completely misunderstood my body language. Look, why don't we go and sort this out? I'm sure we can all come together and exchange apologies and understand that it was just a misunderstanding. She said this, pointing over her shoulder to where we came from. I thought for a moment before answering, No thanks, I understood everything perfectly, and my day is still ruined. I turned and headed towards the car. When I reached it I realized that I had come this way alone. I looked back and saw her in the distance at the drinks table. I thought for a moment, risking biting my tongue off as my vision went red, then got into the car and started it up to turn on the air conditioning. I sat for a while, studying the details of the manufacturer's emblem on the steering wheel, while the interior cooled down, even if my anger did not cool down. In the end, I said to myself, fuck it all, and put the car in reverse. Before I could start driving, I heard a knock on the passenger window. Kelly was standing there, giving me a what-the-hell gesture. I put the car back into park, the doors unlocked, and my wife climbed inside in a fit of irritation. What is your problem? I only came over to offer our apologies, and Mr. Knowles was kind enough to apologize too, she said. Apologize? For what? This guy's a world-class asshole. There was a lot going on today, but when it comes down to it, there was nothing atypical. Wait. Mr. Knowles? Kelly was taken aback for a moment because I never, I mean never, talk like that. This should have been a warning sign for her, but she brushed it off because the five minutes she spent with him told her something else. She then blushed briefly at the name of her new acquaintance, but then, in a subconscious attempt to stay on top, she felt angry again. Great! I tried to do the right thing, but you decided to attack me. I can't believe you're acting like this. I never thought you would be such a child. I really have to babysit you, don't I? I have no idea what was on my face, but whatever it was, it took the wind out of her sails. She turned away but did not apologize, apparently believing that I should apologize. The ride home was spent in silence. I, of course, was thoughtful and decided that she was too, but the only time I dared to look in her direction... I saw a faint reflection of her face in the window. It was faded, but there was a smile on her face. Was she daydreaming? We didn't say a word to each other that evening, and after that, everything was cool between us. There were the usual joint conversations. Small talk. Discussion of everyday things. Not the slightest hint of intimacy. I thought gloomily about how quickly what we had with her had evaporated. After that fateful picnic... The lousy mood calmed down, but it never went away. As much as I didn't deserve Jack Knowles to come into my life, I also didn't deserve to have my life partner take his side. The next workday after the picnic, Jack tried to publicly accept my apology, which I never made. I barely caught the thinly veiled mockery, but now for a different reason. I was no longer loose. I encased myself in stone. For the first time in my life, I didn't go with the flow. Now I was resentful. His comment was simply thrown into the general pile. You could say I had something of a crisis of faith. For the first time in my life, my lifelong ingrained defense mechanism was failing me. I had a hard time dealing with this, which is understandable. The more I thought about my wife, the worse the taste in my mouth became. After a few days, a man is supposed to come to his senses and apologize. But I had nothing to apologize for, and it was not possible to earn Kelly's forgiveness. In fact, even receiving an apology from her was not interesting. I realized that I don't care. I began to analyze her every action from a new point of view. Has she always had these little bad habits? Did I just not notice them? Was I suppressing minor irritations out of love? Frankly, among the new questions, there were also minor annoyances something that I undoubtedly knew before, but now I feel. I realized that her taste in music really sucked. 
I thought that her car was a pigsty. There must have been at least ten empty disposable coffee cups on her passenger seat. Why does it seem to me that I have only discovered all this now? And why is it suddenly bothering me? However, all this was just a reaction to what she felt towards me. I'd bet money that she thought she was good at hiding it, but now I was watching her, first time to be honest. I noticed barely noticeable things, tiny grimaces at my habits that she discovered she didn't like. I felt her contempt for me, even pity. Hell, apologizing because I didn't do anything wrong would probably make things worse. We fell out of love with each other without even fighting. It's strange, but I wasn't even sure it bothered me that much. This thought tormented me more than the thought that I could lose her. Before all of this, I would have sworn that Kelly was out of my league and I would never have anyone better than her again. Now I looked at this beautiful woman, and the only thing that came to my mind was betrayal. Weeks passed, and there was calm again at the front. I didn't hear a sound from Jack at work, but I noticed his wolfish grin when he thought I wasn't looking. My newfound focus was also on work. No one spoke to me in the office unless it was about work. I could feel their discomfort around me. I felt their pitying glances. I was starting to hate them all. My boss delegated difficult tasks to me and thought he was doing it subtly enough that I wouldn't notice. I thought that these were all rumors received after my humiliation at the picnic. But this was just the tip of the iceberg. There was a lot more to those looks that were thrown at me, as I soon learned. The final death of my old life came in the men's room in the main lobby of my company. I didn't usually use this place, but I became so withdrawn, resentful, and angry at everything. I thought about how all this was eating me up inside, looking at the prepared dinner on my table. Screw it, I thought. I need to pamper myself. I haven't done this in a very long time. I decided that if Jack could treat himself to long lunches, so could I. I threw my lunch in the trash and headed towards the main entrance, thinking about the fact that there was an upscale steakhouse downtown. On the way, I wanted to take a leak, so I went to the toilet. Although I just needed to pee, I was in such a mood that I went into the last booth. I had just finished and was about to reach out to flush when two guys walked up to the urinals. They weren't exactly quiet, but they obviously thought they were alone. I recognized them by their voices, but I didn't know which one was which, Mike and Gavin. Both worked with Knowles on the loading dock and were a couple of footmen. Seriously, we never grow up, do we? Hey, are you sure you want wings? We have time to go get a steak, said the guy, whose name I think was Gavin. Damn if they didn't have the same idea as me. Only after salary. My wife will skin me, Mike apparently replied. Gavin laughed briefly. Mike felt the need to clarify this statement. Hey, we can't all be Jacks. Not a damn thing like that. I still can't believe he's entertaining Nikki's wife. What did he say? Do you really think so? Is this arrogance even for him? Oh yes, he is, Gavin said. Ever since, right after the barbecue, he practically picked her up there. He told me he would squeeze her by next week. They meet for lunch. He's probably in her bed right now, at the very moment that we're talking. Do you think little Nikki knows? Mike asked. Who knows, dude? And who cares? What else could he do about it? They laughed, blushing. At least the bastards washed their hands, even though it meant I had to awkwardly stand in the last stall for another 30 seconds. They never noticed me. It was at this moment that I learned that you can be shocked without being surprised. Unlike the guy who was here a minute ago, I didn't have the slightest doubt that what I heard was true. It made so many pieces fall into place in my mind. But that doesn't mean that what he heard out loud didn't hit like a ton of bricks. The looks my colleagues were giving me made even more sense now. I finished my business on autopilot, not even paying attention to my reflection in the mirror as I washed my face. The only thought in my head was that I no longer had an appetite. And when my car pulled out of the parking lot, I had no intention of driving downtown. If I had any doubts before I pulled up to the house, they would have been dispelled when I saw Kelly's car park it out front, and an SUV that I could only assume belonged to Knollys. Hell, they don't even try to hide it. 
The neighbors are as well aware of what is happening as my colleague use. I thought dejectedly. It's still strange. For me to remember this. I had to feel heartbroken about it all. Maybe it was. But the blue of Hardeki was completely washed away by the red anger of betrayal. My anger was a hot coal in the pit of my stomach. As I walked up to the front door, it occurred to me that I wasn't the least bit afraid of Jack the Mountain. At that moment, all my cognitive abilities were occupied with retribution. I have already heard the expression, red veil. Now I understood perfectly what it meant. It was as if a red filter of hatred had been placed over my vision. They could be heard through the door, but as soon as I opened it, the sound of rough sex was unmistakable. There was a short walk along the carpet to visually confirm the reality of my marriage. They were both completely naked, so they decided not to rush into quick sex. From my position by the door, and given the position of our bed, I was mostly behind them, but at a sufficient angle to see their silhouettes. I've seen enough. He turned and retreated to the wall next to the doorway, out of sight. Not that I need to be particularly secretive. I was still furious, but, oddly enough, seeing them with my own eyes brought me down a little. I didn't mean to attack. I needed to weigh my options. Somewhere from the depths of my psyche, my old self resurfaced. Wait, nothing good will come of this. There's nothing you can do without making the situation worse. Just come back and have lunch. Pretend you didn't see anything, but just as quickly as the new self sealed, the old self retreated. To hell! You've stayed away from this your whole life. Look where this has led. You are a pathetic boy with an unfaithful wife, no matter what you tell yourself. I started to think. He looked into the bedroom for a second. My gaze fell on the back of Jack's head. No doubt I was furious with my wife, but that bastard was the one who started it all. Kelly made the decision to cheat on me, but he's been pushing for it ever since he saw her picture. He decided that he could do this to me. This had to be answered in such a way that he would curse his arrogance on his dying day. No matter how furious I was, I was not an idiot. If I challenged him, he would put me in a coma and my lover would probably laugh as she watched. Then she would tell the cops that I was the one who attacked him. Even if I hit him, I would quickly feel sick. Maybe if I had a weapon, a baseball bat, or maybe I have a crowbar in my garage, a good slap on the wrist might help. But it was possible that he would recover quickly. How hard can I hit? It's not for nothing that he was nicknamed The Mountain. Maybe I can hit him in the head. But what if I kill you? I'd be lying if I said I wasn't thinking about murder at that moment regardless of the consequences. But I knew I didn't want Jack Knowles to die that day. I wanted him to regret his decision to humiliate me for a long time. At that moment, I saw the light. It wasn't just me. The point is, in him. Jack Knowles had a large balance on his karmic credit card. But today, the time of reckoning has come. And today, he will face the consequences, and he will regret it. Now I felt that my revenge was not only justified but that I was an instrument of justice. I had to balance the cosmic scales. So what could I do? I was in the minority. What to do when you are physically superior? Then you need to outwit your sworn enemy. This is good. He's the kind of guy who can always find work as a fence post if pickup and delivery don't work out. But what good does this do me? He's having fun with my wife. What can I do? No, no. I couldn't fight him and my wits wouldn't be useful right now. No, for this, I had to drive my enemy to madness. All my life I've been maneuvering. My wife and Jack took advantage of this to have sex behind my back. It's time for a sharp turnaround. You might be surprised how long I thought about this while the man I hated most in the world made noise while entertaining the former love of my life on my own bed. In fact, my neurons were firing so fast that these myriad thoughts race through my head in nanoseconds. It takes more time to read, let alone write, this thought than to think about it. I quietly went downstairs. Not that I needed to be very quiet, but I wanted to ensure they wouldn't notice. I snuck into the garage. In the cabinet above the small built-in workbench, I pulled out my trusty, nearly full can of WD-40. Then he went back inside, 
walked over to the decorative fireplace where Kelly kept her scented candles and picked up the lighter she kept there. After finishing my preparations, I sneaked back into the bedroom. As I snuck up behind him, Lady Luck was finally on my side. I noticed that Jack had a natural macho look. He was a pretty hairy guy and obviously didn't believe in any kind of grooming. For me, it was only better. Just as I was about to take aim, his grunts became louder and more frantic. Perfect. I chuckled. There is a god, and he delivers my enemy into my hands. Not only was I going to ruin Mr. Knowles's day, and, in fact, his entire life, although Jack probably thought that I might catch them one day, maybe even looked forward to it, he didn't seem to entertain the idea of me defeating him. I imagine he imagined I would cry or scream in shock. Maybe I'll attack him and give him the opportunity to beat the crap out of me. So there's no doubt that the hiss behind him, then the oily sense of shone down his back and the sudden pungent aroma of every man's favorite lube outside the bedroom was so foreign to him in that moment that his brain couldn't even register it for a long second. Plus, he was on the verge of exploding. What the hell was all he could say spinning on the spot too late to prevent the oil from covering his hairy back, while continuing to remain just as hairy in front. He reflexively closed his eyes as the fine mist hit his face, which worked, but not before he saw me. Damn bonus, he doesn't even take care of his pubes. I hope that at that moment he had enough presence of mind to understand what was about to happen to him. Maybe there was even enough time not to take it seriously. No one can be that crazy right? I clicked the wheel of my lighter and brought it to the spatter cone. The effect was so unexpected that it even slightly surprised me. The fog turned into a stream of flame. A second later, the mountain might have changed his nickname to the Human Torch. A second later, the screams started. I have no idea if Jack was an experienced boxer, but the wild swing was easy to avoid. Frankly, his first priority was probably to knock the can out of my hand. After that, he took a couple of awkward steps towards me, waving both arms. Only his size worked against him as I dodged his blow. Now we switched places in the bedroom and I resumed the violence. I quickly noticed Kelly, mainly to make sure she wasn't interfering. She climbed onto the edge of the bed and curled into a ball, her eyes wide in shock and horror. The primitive instinct of lust in her immediately faded away when it was replaced by an even more primitive instinct to get away from the fire. I couldn't help but think that some illusion in her mind about how this confrontation could hypothetically unfold was crumbling as the new reality took hold, and she was having a hard time accepting what she was seeing. Jack was in a panic. He moved aimlessly towards our dresser, shouting incoherently and waving his arms. The thought crossed my mind that the room might catch fire, but there was nothing flammable in his immediate vicinity as long as he continued to move. I didn't care either. It was funny watching the flaming figure lose his composure. Obviously, I didn't think well. Well, I mean, I just found my wife in bed with another man, but he really couldn't think clearly. After all, he was on fucking fire. At that moment, a thought struck me. If this were a movie or something like that, the main character would have a witty line at the ready. For the first time since this all started, I felt the need to say something. Hey, Jackie, light it up, come on. Okay. I wish I could come up with something better, but it was in the moment. The main thing is that I wanted my words to be burned into his memory forever. Heh <laughs> heh. Burned out. Finally, some part of his gray matter began to work, and he fell to the floor and began to roll around. This is an important safety tip. If you ever catch fire, stop, fall, and roll. However, it should be noted that stop, drop, and roll will not work if you are being deliberately set on fire by a man you underestimated because you are a complete asshole, and this man is standing right over you and continues to shower you with fire. Right after that, I finally stopped because I noticed that the carpet was on fire. His skating would stop it, but not if I kept giving him a premature Viking funeral. The flames gave way to smoke and the air filled with an acrid smell. His agonizing cries died down, turning into pitiful moans of agony. I realized that someone was laughing maniacally and then I realized that it was me. And he stopped. 
Standing there, I was no longer angry. I felt neither rage nor pain from betrayal. All I felt at that moment was jubilation, the triumph of victory over the enemy. At that moment, I understood the caveman when he crushed the skull of his rival from the next cave, or the samurai ronin when he felt his blade pierce the fiend that killed his sensei. I quickly looked around my bedroom, confident that there would be no fire in the house. Then he took one last look at Kelly. She turned pale under my gaze, afraid that she was next. But I didn't mean to hurt her. As I turned to leave, I thought I saw a flash of remorse in her eyes, as if the scales of the last few weeks had fallen off her. Well, it's too late now. As I walked to the front door, the smoke alarm went off. I stood on the steps and casually tossed the WD-40 and lighter into the yard before sitting down. In front of the door, I was overwhelmed by a whirlwind of thoughts and emotions. I admit I felt fear and uncertainty about my future, but I did not have an ounce of regret. I took out my phone and for some reason clicked on Facebook. I hardly ever use it, and I'm not one to be inundated with friends and notifications. The only reason was that I knew it would get out and felt the need to speak out. I switched the message status from friends only to public and started typing. When people find out what just happened, I want them to know that I won't make excuses or complain. Suffice it to say that the guy in question thought so. He considered himself a hot macho. It turned out that he was right. That's all. I pressed share and threw my phone onto the jar. I sat and waited. It was a good day. It seemed like too long before I heard sirens in the distance. How long did it take my wife to come to her senses after her lover came out of the oven? It turned out that in the near future I had to do a lot of sitting and waiting. I did not offer any resistance to the police and did not utter any words other than short confirmations that I was submitting while I was detained and processed. I was silent during the interrogation. I knew I didn't have to talk, and I didn't see the point in it. There was no doubt about what had happened. I made no attempt to find a lawyer, so imagine my surprise when one appeared in the interrogation room a few days later. I explained to the guy whose suit looked like it cost more than my car that I hadn't asked for a lawyer, and that even if I had, I couldn't afford one. Kelly had probably already drained our bank account, and I knew I was facing a civil lawsuit. He then informed me that I would not have to pay. His firm was offering its services in exchange for its part of the lawsuit I was about to file. What? Am I filing a claim? What news? Of course, an incident in my home would become known, at least at my work. But I underestimated how sensational it would be. Add to that my silent but vague statement on Facebook, and it went viral. I had my 15 minutes of fame sitting in a prison cell, cut off from the rest of the world and suspecting nothing. Everyone at my work seemed to love Jack Knowles, but as it turns out, not as much as they love juicy gossip. Rumors spread like fire through Jack's body. This led to several reporters coming. Not from the Times or anything, but locals were following the juicy story. No doubt excited by the attention the people who had been kissing Knowles's ass have now thrown him under the bus. To be honest, they probably made things look worse than what I actually experienced. But I didn't care. Before the company could do anything, high-profile stories emerged of a hostile work environment that fostered an environment of harassment and abuse. The public perceived me as a long-suffering victim, and the company, they say, approved of all this and it was only a matter of time before I snapped. My lawyer and his firm were not altruistic. These were sharks that smelled blood. Truth be told, I wouldn't have any real business. But this guy was a professional. He had a large company behind him, and my company ended up waist-deep in bad publicity. The lawyer was confident that an agreement worthy of his time could be concluded without any problems. In exchange for my cooperation, they will handle my claim as well as my case. I thought it was quite simple. This may have been the easiest case the police have ever had. However, my new lawyer friend gave me reasonable assurances that he had the ability to significantly soften my landing. I had a clean record and a very sympathetic, very public set of mitigating circumstances. The only thing I asked him to do in return was to have someone handle my divorce. Just get me out of it. 
I was heading to prison, and fighting for anything seemed pointless. He asked if I wanted to prepare a divorce file. This took me by surprise. It's been two weeks already. I didn't think about bail. I just assumed that Kelly had already filed for divorce and was expecting the papers to arrive any day now. But the lawyer said that, to his knowledge, she did not. Strange. As a result, I was sentenced to seven years, with the possibility of parole after five. I have no idea what the final settlement amount with my now former employer was. The law firm that took my case probably didn't want me to know how big their lion's share was. With my share, I cannot retire, but I will have a fresh start when I breathe the air of freedom again. Yes, I was a little annoyed when Jack sued me, but I was far from rich. You can't get blood from turnips. He couldn't buy yachts with my money. There probably isn't enough money in the world to fix how ugly it has become. Besides, I was a prisoner. I still couldn't do anything with my money since the settlement was in another pool that was closed. So Kelly took the hit. He wasn't so macho anymore, was he? No. She had ruined her marriage and her lifestyle for what was now essentially a very expensive gigolo. This was another reason I found it odd that she never filed for divorce. Although since we were married at the time of the incident anyway, I don't think she would have been able to protect her assets from him that way. Doesn't matter. All this was behind large walls from me. As far as I know, I am divorced. I've been here for a year now. I haven't seen or heard from her or tried to contact her. I guess I'll have to deal with her one day. But perhaps not. Five to seven is a long time. I occupied my time with reading and weightlifting. There was nothing else to do, and besides, after leaving prison, I could not set fire to people who would contradict me. I was never going to be big, but I was damn sure I was going to make the most of what I had. Maybe I should get a prison tattoo or two. One last little twist, and I received a letter from a random lonely woman. I've heard about these strange women who start relationships with prisoners by correspondence. I have received more than one promise of eternal love and fidelity from women I have never met. I wasn't going to believe anyone, it was too strange. But it amused me, so here's my story. I don't think anyone was happy except my lawyer, but I think I handled this shitty situation the best I could. I am calm about my life. My prison term is coming to an end. Jack's prison is his own pathetic skin, in which he will remain for the rest of his life. The only thing left is that I still owe myself a stake. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.